I think we are live now, everyone. Thank you very much for joining our session. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever from the world you might be joining us. Um, my name is Tima Schutte. I am a third year MAG member, I'm one of the organizers of this session together with my colleagues. Um, and I need a cheat sheet because there are many, together with my colleagues, Jim Paris, Afiedo, Liana Gastian, Dasi Baniela, and um, a number of others in the Environment Working Group at the IGF. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our session today, um, the first ever environment main session at the IGF. We have an impressive list of speakers and moderators today, um, so I will not take a lot of time because I want to, to uh, hear from all of them. Uh, but I would like you to um, encourage uh, all of you in the audience to make good use of the chat function to share your um, comments, uh, to share any personal views you have, um, and please use the Q&A function to ask our panelists while anything that comes to your mind while you are while they are speaking. I would also like to um, give a quick point of order to um, our panelists. Um, to please try and keep their interventions short and punchy and keep your five minutes allocated time. Um, my colleague Liana has a trusted little bell that she will ring when you have one minute left to speak. Um, and uh, she will also ring the bell once you are out of your allocated time. So please be mindful. We are starting our session 10 minutes after we planned um, due to a slight um, delay. But the <laughs> Um, but we will try and make up for it. Um, and if needed, we will run a little bit late. Uh, I hope you can all stay with us. So without further ado, I would just like you to introduce you to our host for this, um, for this session, Mr. Krzysztof Subert from uh, the Republic of Poland. Um, he is the president and of the management board of the NCBR Investment Fund and is our planning potentiary for our U UNIGF 2021. He is a senior level executive with a 25 year track record of successful strategic and tactical leadership within the ICT industry, an experienced CEO of private companies, and as a secretary of state um, and government plenipotentiary um, track record in national public administration. From 1998 until 2016, he was the president of the management board of Connect Distribution LLC, specializing in the distribution of ICT solutions in the Central Eastern European region. From 2012, um, the Minister for Digital Affairs of the Economic Shadow Cabinet of Business Center Club. In 2015, he was awarded the Polish ICT Man of the Year Prize by Burda Magazine. Um, and in November 2017, he was named one of the 100 Central and Eastern Europe's Emerging Technology Stars. So very impressive bio there. And I will stop there because there are a lot more accolades to, to sing your praises, um, Krzysztof. But, uh, let me pass it over to you um, to start our session and kick off the discussions. Thank you. Okay, okay. So thank you very much, Timea, for this welcoming intervention. So distinguished uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to thank to our MAC colleagues for inviting me to be the overall guest host for this session on environmental issues in the era of digital transformation. Within the uh, opening session, we had a lot about investment funds and uh, fortunes, which I like a lot, and I can speak about that a lot as well. But now let's focus on the uh, environment side of our discussion today. As a former MAC member, it gives me a great pleasure to be here with you today. As you are aware, and what was mentioned, the environment topic has not been a key issue at IGF agenda so far. However, we should have a closer look at this matter, I think. This is because climate change and uh, digital technologies are for sure two of the most defining features of our civilization for the future, especially now during the uh, pandemic time. So I'm personally very happy that we will discuss these two complex issues today at our session. As you may remember, in the city of Katowice, the next year's IGF host took place the UN Climate Summit, uh, COP24, in December 2018. Um, Katowice and the entire Silesian region used to be one of the key symbols of the Polish mi mining industry for many, many years, but now it has transformed into the rapidly growing developing city with many companies focused on new technologies and innovations, which is a really great place to, to have a look at. The linkage between energy production and consumption, as well as the usage of ICTs and its impact on the environment is very strong. And we will come back to that later on 
for sure. So now let's uh, move to our discussion. Uh, just to briefly remind you that we have divided our session into three segments, which is digital technologies uh, for sustainability, reducing the climate impact of digitalization, the second one, and the third one, harnessing data for the environment. All of three are extremely interesting. This is uh, actually, we decided to divide the session into these three uh, segments because to have really the very, very different perspective, having with us a number of distinguished panelists, so we would like to use this opportunity and really discuss that from very different uh, angles. Starting from the positive side, let us now focus on the initiatives and ways of overcoming climate change and building bridges between different sectors of the economy. This is a real cross-cutting issue and there are no simple answers. That is why I, I wish to give the floor now to Mr. Luis Neves, who is the CEO of the Global Enabling Sustainability Initiative. So Mr. Neves, uh, the floor is yours for the next 20, 23 minutes, and then we will back to our mainstream again. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zubert. Um, and I'm very pleased to moderate this section on digital technologies for sustainability. As you mentioned, uh, my name is Luis Neves. I'm running the Global Enabling Sustainability Initiative, which is uh, a business initiative uh, dedicated um, to investigate the role of uh, technology in relation to broad sustainability. Uh, we exist since 20 years. And um, this has been our main purpose and our main work. And I'm very pleased today in moderating this session um, with the panelists, with Mr. Marcus Wust, with, he is the head of the environmental monitoring section of the Swiss Federal Office for Environment, and Ms. Kara Erst, uh, which is vice president, head of worldwide sustainability at Amazon. Thank you so much for joining uh, this session. Before uh, I hand over to you, let me say a few words about uh, the work of Jesse and um, and what we have been investigating in relation to uh, climate change or environment uh, in relation to sustainability. Um, we have published last year two reports, the Digital with Purpose report and the Digital Solutions for Climate Action report with the GIZ. Both these reports present sound data on what digital technologies can do to slow down the effects of climate change. The first report presents concrete case studies of how digital access, faster internet, cloud, the internet of things, cognitive, digital reality, and blockchain can support the sustainable development goals. The report, the report findings show how these technologies can lead to the abatement of 1.34 gigatons of CO2 emissions in 2030 against the business as usual. This can be possible through limited deforestation, reduced supply chain food loss, improved management of renewable energy, enteratic fermentation, and reduced fertilizer user, industry 4.0, energy efficiency, and intelligent transport systems, just to mention some. The second report focuses on what digital technologies can do to support the fulfillment of low and middle income countries and DCs. We analyzed specific countries Brazil, Chile, China, India, Kenya, South Africa, and Vietnam, and specific areas of those countries like power, transportation, manufacturing, and construction and, and agriculture. The report shows that if applied, digital technologies can lead to an overall abatement of 2.1 gigatons of CO2 by 2030, which means 10% of the overall emissions of those countries. In both cases, it is important to stress that digital technologies can mitigate climate change effects, but these must be accompanied by more decisive actions at state and business level. So I'm not saying that everything is good. Uh, I understand that there are different views, different perspectives on, on this. What I would like to stress at the, in our organization in Jesse, we have been uh, looking at this since 2007, uh, we have been issuing different reports, different investigations, 
And uh, the conclusion that we have been coming up with, and this is, a, I would say, a quite strong conclusion, is that digital technologies will be fundamental to address climate change. But anyway, let's listen to our, you know, panelists. Uh, and I would like to invite uh, both of them to join us. Uh, and um, I would like them also to share their perspectives on how can existing and emerging digital technologies contribute to addressing climate change and how can they foster change in various sectors of the economy, uh, manufacturing, trade, agri-food, what initiatives exist and what can be done to improve them. So I would like to invite Marcus Wust to let us know his own views on this. Please go ahead. Yes, hello all together. Thank you very much for having me in this session. I'm replacing Corin Sigward that I need to that I need to excuse, but I, I hope I can entertain you for these next five minutes about our um, pictures uh, with some pictures. I hope you can see them all. Short confirmation from Luis Neves. Yes, yes. yes you can see. Yes. Okay. I also have some links inside. So if you want to follow some of my reports or, or pictures, uh, please find the presentation uh, well, when they will provide it to you. Yeah. So this is our target image in the middle. When we started to cover this issue in our office in, in the yeah, Marcus, ministry Marcus, and agency in Switzerland, sorry. Marco, sorry to interrupt. Can you put this in presentation mode? Yes, try. Better? Yes, much better. Okay. So we, we started approximately four years ago when we saw this target image. Um, the University of Zurich has an active research group dealing with the sustainability of, of computer science and the internet. We discovered this work in, in 2017, and I said, and, and are still guided by this target picture. Um, it can be seen that the ICT sector today produces even more CO2 emissions than the use of ICT has saved so far. Our goal must be to reverse this ratio and use the new technologies in such a way that they ultimately save more CO2 than they themselves consume for their operation. In the meantime, many ideas have emerged as to how this could be done. A collection of such ideas and tips for municipalities and companies can also be found on the website of the University of Zurich, which we provide here with a link. Now, if, if we really, I'm um, sorry, if we want to deep a little bit more into this, what can we do? We, we have to look in the value chain. Of course, you, you know this probably, there is, um, sorry, next picture. Um, there are a lot of companies that, um, IT companies included, that have committed themselves to get rid of their CO2 impact. Companies usually start by reducing um, their direct emissions in the middle of scope one, but there's a growing number that are extending this commitment to their suppliers and supply chains. Uh, covering the effects of the, on the customer side, however, is the most difficult part. But there are already some approaches that I would like to show you a little bit. Um, simplified picture of the economic circle. This clearly shows that the consumption cannot be automated at will. However, this, this purchase decision is in the middle of um, going this, to this scope three. And in, in particular, it's an important lever for incorporating the environmental aspect in general, not only CO2. Now, some, some samples that I can show you in Switzerland. One idea is the integration of information, and even compensation possibilities in the, in the digital shops. In Switzerland, such options are already available in many areas. This goes to private consumption, private consumers. Here's an example of an electricity provider and an online retailer from Switzerland. This is one of the best ways for suppliers or traders to influence, influence their downstream impact to scope to go to scope three. Um, however, as public office, you have also these buying decisions, and um, we, we that's that's the main 
um, initiative that I would like to, to show you from Switzerland. We um, had so far um, public procurement law covered four purposes, economy, competition, transparency, and even equal treatment. Uh, one of certainly one idea that comes out of the SDGs, but now from 2021, we will start with this new criteria that really goes deep into the sustainability. This criterion should actually be built, in effect, not, not only in the public procurement law, but into all markets and jobs. To this end, product data that um, is linked in these, in these shops must, must be um, uh, added with environmental impact data of products throughout their whole life cycle. And then therefore we need to standardize, standardize the data on products and the environment. And this is really a big challenge ahead. We will probably hear a little bit more in the session today. Um, but this, this effect um, to, to go to the directly with environmental information to the shopping decisions made by public offices or private consumers or business to business approaches. This will help to, to green the overall economy with the help of digitalizations. So this is the main idea that I would, would wanted to show you. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't succeed the five minutes. And if you want to see more, um, you can, um, go deeper into these issues by the book or by block issues that I show you here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus. Um, I think it was very comprehensive. I would like to hand over to Maja Dabagi from Amazon. Please go ahead. Hi, Luis. I think you mean me. Kara Hurst from Amazon. Hi. I'm doing <laughs> I do apologize. <laughs> No worries. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much and uh, wonderful to be here with all of you today. Um, thank you so much for the invitation from the Internet Governance Forum and, and the opportunity to share what we're doing at Amazon. Um, my name is Kara Hurst. I lead the development uh, and, and execution of our global sustainability work at Amazon, and that crosses all of our business areas globally, including our retail, cloud computing operations and products. And we are focused primarily on using Amazon scale, as well as, as our uh, capabilities for speed and innovation to really double down on sustainability. And I'll share a little bit with you today around some of the things that we're working on specifically, and then some broad goals that we've set. So one thing I wanted to just get to very quickly um, in the context of this conversation is an exciting project we have called the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative, or we call it ASDI which seeks to accelerate sustainability research and innovation by minimizing cost and time required to um, both acquire and analyze large sustainability data sets. So this is a very important part, we think, of our sustainability work um, to address climate change, really enabling uh, our core skills at Amazon and our Amazon Web Services business. We work with scientific organizations such as NOAA and NASA, uh, the UK Met Office and government of Queensland, and we identify and host and deploy key data sets off of the AWS cloud. Um, these include weather observations, satellite data, forecast data, uh, climate projection data, satellite imagery, hydrological data, air quality data, ocean forecast, you get the picture. Um, but on and on around these types of data sets that really come together and have not yet um, been available in the cloud many times and haven't been co-located. We also work with a group called the Group on Earth Observations, which offers research and organizations access to the AWS cloud uh, to help countries realize the potential of Earth observations for sustainable development. And we support Digital Earth Africa, which enables African nations to track changes across the continent. This is really kind of an unprecedented way of looking at this detail, making Earth observation data, uh, again, more easily accessible. So we think one of the core things we can help to do is to put these data sets together. They provide really valuable insights around better decision making uh, for prevention and planning, um, including things around flooding and droughts and soil and coastal erosion, uh, agriculture, forest cover, land use, water availability, and so forth. 
Uh, we also work with some clean energy startups in this space to produce real time historical and forecast estimates of the available solar radiation resources around the globe, and which helps to scale up the deployment of renewable energy as efficiently as possible. So that's just one specific example of, um, in this way, how we're uh, connecting data and technology and cloud computing services to promoting more uh, accessible information around climate change effects. We, just to go back up to our macro level, um, we've committed at Amazon to the Climate Pledge, which is our commitment to reach net zero carbon by 2040, so a decade ahead of the Paris Agreement. And we co-founded this pledge about a year ago in September 2019 with Global Optimism, uh, which is led by Christiana Figueres, who many of you will know, uh, who led the, the Paris Agreement uh, in 2015. And we're doing a number of things at the company uh, to commit to being on this path to net zero carbon by 2040. One is we've committed to 100% renewable energy by 2025, so on an interim basis to power all of our global operations with 100% renewable energy. Uh, we have ordered uh, 100,000 fully electric delivery vehicles. We've invested $100 million um, into our fund on reforestation projects. And we also see the potential of the e-commerce business that we're in. So we're making significant investments to drive our carbon footprint to zero. Um, and we know that uh, from our scientific research, shopping online is inherently already car more carbon efficient than going to the store. And we're trying to share more of that information to show which products and services can really drive um, this. We've spent about three years developing models and tools and metrics to measure our own carbon footprint, but we're sharing more of that detailed analysis uh, to see how you know shopping online and some of the transportation that we're doubling down on electrifying uh, can consistently generate less carbon than driving to a store. We know a single delivery van trip can take approximately 100 round trip car journeys off the road on average. Um, so we have a lot to share in our online information about our commitment to tackling climate change, uh, some of the ways in which we're making data much more widely available. And I'll end there. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Karen, and my apologies for my previous mistake. And uh, thank you for letting us know about the amazing achievements from Amazon and for the progress that you have been making. And so I think it's now time for Q&A. Timea, could you help me with questions? I see lots of participants in this call. I'm sure that we'll have many questions to both of our panelists. Yes, thank you, Lewis. There's indeed a lot of discussion in the chat, but I haven't seen much many questions asked. So please, everyone, uh, go to the Q&A and ask your questions. While we wait for them, I'd like to turn to our first discussant, to Ms. Majda Dabagi from the ICC. Um, uh, Majda, you are one of the co-founders of the SME Climate Hub, um, which is a, a platform to help uh, businesses of all sizes to make pledges such as um, the one Kara just mentioned from Amazon. Can you tell us a little bit about that initiative and how do you think it links up with the discussion? Sure, absolutely, thank you so much. And uh, thanks for the upgrade earlier, Lewis. <laughs> um, so great to see initiatives just like Amazon's. We're really seeing so many businesses um, coming forward with really a progressive, very bold uh, climate commitments. Um, and in order for companies uh, such as Amazon and uh, to be able to really address their um, full value chain, we need to kind of address the SMEs uh, in that value chain. So one of the ways in which we're, uh, what we're looking at doing really is to mobilize and also support SMEs in the value chains of companies who have made um, strong climate commitments. Uh, to help them to align with their supply chain leader. So whether it's a 2030 target for net zero or 2040, like the climate pledge, um, but certainly no later than, than 2050, which is what the science tells us is needed. Uh, SMEs can come onto the SME Climate Hub. They can make a commitment that is internationally recognized by the United Nations uh, Race to Zero campaign and align with uh, a net zero target. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Race to Zero campaign, there's parallel discussions happening now uh, within the United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change, 
uh, called the Race to Zero Dialogues. Race to Zero is really all about bringing together all stakeholders, whether they're governments, business, investors, uh, universities, uh, you name it, um, all around one goal, which is really to, uh, to make the Paris Agreement uh, ambition a reality and align stakeholders with net zero by 2050 at the latest uh, targets. So um, on the SME Climate Hub, a company with less than 500 employees could come to make a internationally recognized climate commitment and also access uh, tools and resources that will help that company to very practically um, curb its emissions, uh, measure and track progress, and also uh, benefit from a large number of incentives, including recognition from its supply chain leaders, recognition by the United Nations, um, and uh, we're working on financial and policy incentives as well. So encourage you all to uh, have a look at the SME Climate Hub, whether you're a supply chain leader or a small business, uh, there is definitely a place for you there to link up to the Race to Zero. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Master. I got your name right right now. I, I saw a question coming up from um, David Jensen. Maybe I can spell it for you, for Carlos. Uh, the question is, how can we get the environmental performance of all products on Amazon offered to consumers in an easy way and comparable way? Great. Uh, well, thank you very much for the question. It's something we are very passionate about is to make these kinds of um, sustainability information more visible to customers. Uh, we actually just launched a program both in the United States and North America and in Europe called Climate Pledge Friendly. Um, this makes it easier for customers to discover and shop for more sustainable products. We did this in a way that has a very high bar. We used um, 18 different uh, external certifications, and they do differ between those two geographies. But we looked at third parties, um, groups like, uh, you know, kind of the um, certification bodies that are looking deeply at the ways in which products are made, and thinking more about um, the sustainability attributes, making those visible to customers. We also created one of our own called Compact by Design. So customers, when they now shop online, will see these certifications, will see information about what's involved in these certifications. And these cross not only some Amazon products, but they, they are brands that people would recognize. Um, and it's a really exciting way to start to convey sustainability information more broadly to customers. So these are, um, you know, I think attributes that when you look at package dimension, item weight, number of units to calculate the unit efficiency of a product. It's very much science driven um, and it's been externally verified. We've worked with partners um, as well, you know, outside of Amazon to, to verify this information and provide, you know, again, credibility behind it. So we're excited about the beginning of this that we can easily make it um, visible to customers where they can shop for sustainable products. And again, it's called Climate Pledge Friendly and you can see a lot about the certifications um, the different ways in which we're, you know, telling customers um, information will we'll increase the number of products enrolled. And in fact, there's already been thousands since we launched that have applied for these certifications and uh, to be part of the program. Luis, I'm afraid you're on mute still. Thank you so much. Uh, Timel, do we have any questions coming up? Yes, we had um, one question that I think will be addressed in the next session um, regarding the digital uh, technologies environmental impact. So please, our next two speakers, um, um, be prepared to, to um, answer that. Um, and there's one more question, and I hope that we can answer that very, very quickly. Do speakers think it is feasible for developing countries um, to build environmental impact checks into a procurement policy? Does it need capacity development for both government as well as for companies who bid for services? How does one prevent this from being a tick box exercise? Maybe a question for Marcus? Yes, I'll try to answer this. Um, well, it's, it's really the beginning, the checkbox exercises. Um, in the end, we probably should use AI assistance for um, 
buying to, to help buying decisions to integrate um, all these other information than the price. So you really really need to get a little bit, a bit away from the price as unique identifier for your buying decision. And of course, the more data you have on environment disease, it can become so complex that we probably need more um, help from AI. And, and this will probably automate a little bit our buying, uh, buying decisions, but can also help us to, to integrate environment, social, uh, and other issues into the choosing of your product that you want. And a Amazon is, is on the front on this, I am sure. Very good. So Timea, do we still have time for another question or shall we move on to the conclusions? We should move on. Thank you. We should move on. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so thank you very much, Mr. Nervous for this important and interesting discussion. It shows that the use of the ICT and the digital technologies in general can create a lot of synergies with other sectors of the uh, economy, which is, uh, which is really great. Uh, and uh, what is more, they make a big impact on those sectors and contribute to create new value chains and business models, which is uh, really good to see, and especially now. Now let us move uh, to the second area of interest today, which is uh, maybe a little bit somewhat negative effect of the digitalization post on the climate and how we could reduce this impact. Uh, firstly, let us uh, proceed by presenting the possible influence of digitalization process and the ICT sector as a whole on the climate. So there are generally three areas of interest. Uh, the first one touches the so-called direct carbon emissions coming from the manufacturing process as well as uh, further use of disposal of the equipment we use today on daily basis, such as telephones, computers, routers, elements of the networks, etc. The second one covers the indirect effects created by the usage of these devices and other spheres of life, like transportation, logistics, business management. So we mentioned that already a little bit. And the third one, it touches upon the psychological effect of our behaviors and preferences toward the usage of ICTs in our everyday life. So three very interesting angles to, to re angles to really uh, look at. So um, let us start the discussion around that topic at the moment, that part of our meeting. So let me present the panelists uh, for this uh, for this segment. The first one, Miss Maya Orma Zabal Herrero. Head of Environment and Climate Change at Telefonica. And the second one, Ms. Lili Edinam Botsoye, Community Engagement Lead at the Board Member at Hacklab Foundation. So they both represent the business and NGOs perspective, which is uh, per perfectly fitting to our uh, current discussion. If I may, I would like to begin our panel by addressing Ms. Maya Ormazabal Herrero. I would like to ask you to share with us your experience and maybe good practices from your company, from your life, particularly what can be done to reduce the carbon footprint of the digital uh, technologies. So, Madam, the floor is yours. You have five to six minutes. So, yes, please start. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thanks for, for introducing uh, me and, and also for inviting Telefonica to, to share our experience on how are we trying to, to reduce the impact of, of digitalization when we are providing no, um, solutions to our clients. So just a quick, uh, a quick um, view of what is Telefonica, because maybe some of the audience is not aware of what is our company about. We are a telecom company, a network telecom company um, based on, on Europe, but we have businesses also in, in Latin America. Our main businesses are based in Spain, Brazil, Germany, and the UK. What, uh, in terms of uh, sustainability strategy, we really see this is a, a competitiveness uh, issue and, and it's really helping progress uh, in the company. And we are confident that the, the digital transformation will lead to a more sustainable world as it has been shared in the, in the first um, 
table, round table. So we are both trying to reduce the impact of our operations really to deploy and to, to give uh, solutions to our clients to a low carbon economy so that the solutions are based in, um, in a really green uh, network. Our climate goals are really aligned with the 1.5 degree scenario. Um, we have committed to be 100 renewable in 2030, although in our main markets, we are already 100, uh, consuming 100 renewable electricity nowadays. We have been able to decouple energy efficiency from traffic growth. In our business, it's very important. Uh, we, our uh, main um, consumption, I mean, main environmental impact comes from electricity consumption, and we have been able to decouple this both. So we are nowadays uh, reducing the energy consumption by petabyte, and we are going to reduce it by 90% between 2015 and 2025. And, uh, and all this is really conducting us to reduce our emissions. So we have been committed, we have committed ourselves to become net zero company in scope one and scope two before 2025. And, and also we are reducing our value chain emissions that as was mentioned before, it's very relevant also. And we have been able to, we are going to reduce it almost 40% uh, before 2025. And all these to really have a really green network, really green operations, and also so we're, that we can uh, help our clients to reduce their own emissions. And we have been committed ourselves to reduce the, to help our clients to avoid 5 million tons of CO2 yearly in 2025, thanks to our services of telecommuting, smart energy, cloud, IoT, video and audio conferencing, and fleet management, for example. But how we are going to achieve these targets? Because they are really challenging targets, no? So we, we have we, to reduce CO2 emissions in our sector is very relevant to, to transform our networks, thinking on energy and efficiency all the time. And for that, we are deploying the more uh, green and, and clean technologies like optical fiber and removing the old ones are promoting circular economy at the same time. We are also based, I mean, you, implementing many, many efficient energy efficiency projects based on, on free cooling and, uh, and that only all other technical uh, solutions that we have in place. But also because our main source of emissions come from the electricity consumption, moving towards renewable electricity is, is a really key issue. And for that, uh, we are have a different different strategies depending on the country, depending on the on the momentum. So we have uh, guarantees through guarantees of origin, but also to PPAs agreements that we have signed in Spain, Brazil, and Mexico, and also well improving in sorry increasing self generation in our own facilities is is another kind of a strategy. So with with uh, green. With a green operation, we can really help very much and take all the potentiality of the of the of the digitalization to decarbonize other sectors. And what we have been doing until now has been able having uh, help us to to issue two green bonds until until now. Also, we are part of the CTPA list and and other well things that I have mentioned before, but. Um, what we have is the targets, but also the results. So our performance is, is quite good until now, as I have mentioned before, we have been able to reduce 50% uh, our emissions globally and to keep uh, energy consumption always almost flat uh, uh, until, I mean, instead of the traffic that is increasing uh, year on year. So this is all from our side. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, thank you. Now I would like to hand over to uh, Ms. Lili Edinam Botsoye, who is a great example of skilled IT expert and manager, as well as the representative of youth from the West Africa. She's currently working for the HackLab Foundation and will share her experience in capacity building and communication around environmental sustainability and climate change. In particular, what lessons can be learned from the perspective of various communities based on your experience? So, Ms. Botsoye, the floor is yours for the next six minutes as well. Thank you. 
Right. Hi, everyone, and good afternoon from Accra, Ghana, and happy to meet everybody. So sorry um, I'm in the dark because um, my lights just tripped right before the meeting, but I'll try and be quick about this and then move to a very interesting part where we talk about what young people around the world have rallied to work on regarding greening the internet. And that's what you see on my screen. But let me start with the reason why I got interested with wanting to know the intersection of the internet, digital technologies and environment. And it just goes to show, to show that um, um, we are naturally becoming, or technology is naturally becoming an extension of who we are. Who ever thought that you could actually have um, effects of things done online felt offline? But this is how we've come, that we are part of the system and not just uh, working in isolation. So I'll start with the, with the work we are doing, or what we've seen in, in my sub-region and in Ghana for a start, with regard um, the, 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 the impact of um, in, in digital technologies and electronics and all that. And maybe you've not heard, but I'm here to let you know about a place called Agobloshi in Accra. And it is, it is one of the largest dam sites um, in Ghana, if not in West Africa, and it's very popular. So I'll share something about it and how it's, it's, it's giving me the interest in researching and knowing how we can have sustainable um, um, use of technologies. So in, in Agbogloshi, you, it would interest you to know that um, the issue there is about not just a doom, but probably looking as a blessing in disguise for some people. So what happens in Agbogloshi is that there is um, import and heavy dismantling of um, technologies and electronics so that people can find uh, things they could sell and to feed com communities. So you want to look at um, the dismantling of these things in these places. And what they do is to dismantle it in very different ways to find 60% of it mostly, which is iron or copper, and 30% which is made up of plastics, and then 2.7 are hazardous pollutants. And in this place, there are about 20,000 people living in the place. And these people are feeding in the place. They are working in the place. And they're making ends meet from what is being done in the dams. So you'd want to look at what is happening, why we are this place, and what has come to be. So first of, let's look at the entry, entry points of um, these electronics into the country. And we have door-to-door -door collection. We have um, country scavenging. We have imports and dumps. And we have um, people actually being middlemen and getting these into the country. But it's, 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 it's gotten to a point where we are seeing the impact. So some people even go on to um, talk about the intervention the government has um, brought up to, to help the situation, but we go on to look at what more can be done. So from my point and speaking from experience of communication of these dangers, we want to look at the recognition of the informal sector activities. Now in Ghana, 95% of the work that is done with regards e-waste and recycling is actually informal. So we want to look at the awareness creation and how people are involved in getting in, in, in in providing information on what the processes are, that could probably lead to the better um, recycling of these things. And you want to look at the knowledge transfer. So these are people who have probably left school and working to meet and make ends meet, but don't know how to um, probably do it the right way. But when that time, when the, the time comes for policy discussions, they are sidelined, even though they are those doing the work, and then there are regulations that actually pass behind them and don't actually um, help them to a great extent. Now we've seen that. The impact is, is, is gone from just being, just being an individual approach to solve the situation, but we need a more systematic reform. And that is why the work we've done as young people uh, for the Youth for Digital Sustainability Program, which was done this year and a couple from some months past and with people around the world is very important. Seems like uh, yeah, Eddie has some yeah. technical issues. Yeah, we lost Ms. Botsoyev. That is very unfortunate. While we wait, okay. uh, maybe we can go to the questions. Yes, I, I, exactly. So, so pretty a lot of interesting points. Uh, brought by Miss Maya and Lily, so hopefully she will be able to, to continue in a couple of minutes. But in the in meantime, we, we do have the 
few minutes uh, allocated for questions and answers. So if there are any questions to both panelists or to the session in general, uh, we can do it right now. So, so, so if the moderator can help me to read them out or if you can write them out in the, in the bottom in the Q&A uh, option, not maybe in the chat. So it will be much easier to, uh, to bring them and then treat them. Right, can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, please, can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes, now I can hear you, yes. Okay, sure. So let me just present briefly before the internet trips again, what we, what we worked on as young people. And the, I'll go to the first recommendation we had regarding greening the internet. What we discussed was that we want to, um, we, are, we are calling on government or different stakeholders and having messages that are tar targeted to certain people. And our first message is that we should actively strive to mitigate the environmental impact of the internet and ICTs. And both public and private stakeholders should strengthen the collaboration by following a framework that allows for responsible growth, consumption of digital resources and promotion of innovation. And want to look at our second message, where we ask that the promotion, um, the prom promoting access to the internet and other ICTs is inherently a matter of sustainability. And if we want to connect the next billion, we must do so in an eco-friendly way, taking into consideration the significant environmental impact that digitalization comprehends. So for us to be alive and see what to, what, to, what to be there for us in the future, we have to do this in a way that is synchronized with every other thing that nature gives to us. So we want to make sure that in our quest to connect people, our activities shouldn't be negatively um, affecting things that we are benefiting from. Now, our third um, policy recommendation is this, that the environmental impact of the internet and ICTs must be communicated in an accessible and effective language. It's important, it's important to compel stakeholders to action by framing the environmental crisis as an opportunity for change while being based on scientifically accurate information. So you want to have the communication widespread so everybody can understand. If you want to use video, if you want to use audio, but don't make it as though um, you're putting fear in the people so they don't see the bit where there's an option to salvage the situation. And in doing that, we shouldn't sideline it to only one person or just individual um, efforts. We should let people know that this stands from, this starts from a systematic approach of changing things. We want to um, speak directly to stakeholders and we are expanding on these recommendations and writing papers out of them so people get to see how important it is to first know and are aware of the things that are happening and are equipped or um, able to also contribute to doing it and um, to solving the situation. So this is what we have done so far for our youth perspectives. And um, maybe when there are questions, I can expand share some more. I hope you didn't lose me this time around. Yes, thank you. Thank you again. So back to the questions. So, so now I would like to ask our online moderator to, to check the questions we may have in the chat or Q&A box and read them out. So we will do our best to answer them right now. Do we have any questions? Yes, I, I will I will jump in here. I, I see my, my okay. I'll be having some troubles here. Um, so uh, we have a few questions here in the in the chat um, from a number of participants. I'll try and bundle them and put them to the both of you. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully you can you can um, comment. Um, so we have a question about um, 5G networks. Will they have a beneficial impact in reducing the carbon footprint of digital devices, data servers, etc.? Um, another question um, from um, the youth IGF in Germany. Um, Apart from energy consumption, devices and electronic waste is the major problem for the environment. How do Amazon and Telefonica plan to tackle this issue? and how to limit the waste or transition to a more circular model of economy. I guess Maya, as the speaker for this segment that's directed at you. Um, there yeah. is a, and a third question and last one um, from Christos Vasilios. Um, he says, a significant misalignment of the current technology equipment market in regards to environmental impact is the concept of growth. Profit-driven market perceives people as consumers who are encouraged to buy the last latest technology, renewing their gadgets every one to two years. More gadgets mean more depleted physical resources and more waste, waste produced. Is the private sector considering any models to switch 
to the perception of owning a piece of equipment to framing it as a loan from future generations and to the environment. Very interesting questions, and I know that we will cover some of them later on, but now maybe, I, I'm not sure if Miss Maya or Mazabal would like to take the question of 5G? Yeah, I can, I can do that, and also with electronic equipment, but, but just briefly, you know. So we, <laughs> what, what about 5G? Okay, things about when we are deploying a technology, we have to think about the overall picture, no? So what is, is it going to help our uh, clients to reduce their own emissions is going to to be to uh, to allow us you no know, to to reduce emissions of the electric electric sector or or the transport sector for sure but we have to play thinking on on the environmental um so eco design of the network from the beginning and we we we, we can do that we can do that uh but we we have to do it so deploying it also removing and switching off all technologies. And for instance, in Telefonica, we are deploying 5G, but at the same time, we are going to switch off 3G. So, mm -hmm. and 2G. So, so when we are deploying, we have to think on of also at the same time. So switching off and removing now all technologies, because in the end, if you put on top of, of, of the new tech, of technologies and on the top, new technologies, then you are increasing increasing the, the, the electricity consumption. And dealing with the energy efficiency of five years. So five years is going to be more efficient in terms of petabyte. So in terms mm -hmm. of the traffic that we need as a society. So digitalization is it's about everything. I was looking at, at the whole picture. So we really think need to deploy in a very efficient way. We really need to, to based on ele ele uh, renewable electricity in terms of, of the source. And also we need to, to switch off uh, all technologies. And we, we have to think about all of this. And also really, really need to, to innovate you known products and services so really take advantage of all the potentiality of the digitalization. So that's regarding 5G. And we have some studies of the of the efficiency of the 5G comparing it to 4G and it's 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 it really, mm -hmm. it's more efficient at uh, about 90 90% in I mean if you deploy it in a very efficient way. Yes. So we have some figures on that. And and dealing with electronic equipment and that that's the you no know, we have two two main impacts in, uh, in in our sector. One is the electricity consumption and the other is the electronic equipment. We have to to really promote reuse and exactly. eco design more than recycling mm -hmm. because recycling is is exactly. good but we have to to promote reuse and and eco design from the beginning and and we are we are promoting that very much so i mean the old equipment in our clients house we are reusing uh four million in just in one year last year and we have we have to do more and we have also to to encourage our clients to be part of the solution so we are we have to innovate more we have to to think more in eco design in using reusable plastic in using recycling plastics and and all biodegradable uh, material with a really um, low uh, energy consumption but also we have to involve our clients to to think about you no know, these uh, these things and but there are many many things going on in the market if, if you can see to eco rating which is a seal that informs our our clients of a mobile device is it more eco-friendly or is it less and we have these kind of things to to engage exactly. our clients and yes. consumers thank you very for the good questions. comment thank you thank, thank you bye Maya. and uh, miss botsoya would you like to comment on that and jump in in our into our discussion and take one so, of the um, right um, i'll just add something i learned in, in an earlier session today this afternoon was a flash um, talk with youth um, not to say so much on 5G because I don't have so much expertise like tele like telecomunica would do, but uh, what I learned is if the solution is not sustainable, then it's not smart. So we are going to believe that all manufacturers and every stakeholder that will bring something onto the market, provided they have a framework they follow that is sustainable and is going to yield results that they say they do. If only it's that way, then that's when we can see that the solution is smart. Um, I also gathered something that there's probably ways to actually offer um, technologies and solutions to um, everybody around the world and looking at a sustainable angle. So um, I've, I've seen that companies actually um, sometimes give us uh, their footprint, they share the information. Maybe it's, it's time to now explain it some more to all of us. So that's mm -hmm. the bit about communication that is important to us as young people and as people who can get information to thrive on to work 
to better what is happening. So if the solution is coming out and there's, an, there's information that's understandable by all and sundry, not only for people who are too technical and, and can understand, then it uh, means only a small session will understand and can run with the information. So if we want to go out sustainable and we want all the, effort, the efforts to be all encompassing, there should be a way that the communication is clear enough. And there should be um, another way where we can have people rally not because of scarce, but because they understand the issue as it is. So not because people think that they are dying, so they are running to help it, but they know, they know that in as much as this is happening, we are able to salvage the situation with these tools that we have. So there is empowerment to be able to contribute. There is understanding, very clear understanding. And even in my part of the world, when we talk about 5G, we are, we are yet getting to 4G and, and having to stabilize it. So it's not so far-fetched, but this is where we have to understand and understand clearly that this is where we are getting to. And once we are able to um, run with the world and what is happening, eventually everybody gets to a point where it's sustainable enough and we don't have in it we don't have it in a, in a situation where in our quest to connect the hundred the, the next billion we are actually having um, things that are also affecting us in another way so we should smart about our solutions and make the sustainable the sustainable bit of it be what makes this the, the the solution smart exactly yeah very good comment as well sometimes i have the same feeling that we are discussing different technological subjects in different size of bubbles and outside of those bubbles people are not so sure what we are talking about and what what, what the message we would like to to bring okay so uh, let me now just um, jump to the next part so thank you very much um, to all thank our you. attendees for your comments and questions so they constitute the most valuable contribution to our today's discussion and, and it's pretty clear as you can see that, that the situation and our discussion is quite dynamic. However, we must remember that our common goal is to make the best to reduce the environmental impact of digitalization. And we should always keep in mind in our, on, on all our actions and initiatives. So now the question is, is there something more that we can, or ordinary people can do to reduce the carbon footprint in our day-to-day -day habits? And the, the, the answer of course is yes, we can. And there are two main issues which I would like to, to bring to, to the table. So one is the utilization of electricity, electricity from the re renewable resources to charge the batteries of our electronic personal equipment. And in some extenses we can, we can do it. And the second is what was already mentioned is the sustainable usage of these devices by trying to use them as long as possible before their disposal. There is of course one more important point to bring to try to make sure that they are left to formal recycling by handing them to, over to professionals in gathering electronic waste disposal. It's also very, very important having in mind the the sustainability and the environmental uh, future. These are just a few proposals, but, uh, let, but, but they are pretty good, I think, way to, to start. So we have one more segment ahead of us, actually the last one, but not the least. Therefore, I would like to now hand over the floor to Mr. Michael Okia, who is a manager at the Global Forum for Media Development, but also the a researcher and the editor, being the author of over 60 publications in that matter. So Mr. Okia will focus on a very interesting issue as well from my personal perspective, which is data, data usage for the environment, in particular the collection of data, including big data to monitor the emissions and identify climate risk in order to implement this knowledge in business decisions and investments, which is uh, a key for the future, I think. I'm sure Mr. Okia will provide some valuable expertise in that subject matter. So Mr. Okia, the floor is yours. And for your, for your segment of today's discussion, we have as well approximately 20 minutes. So the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christoph. Uh, as you said, my name is Michael Ogia, um, and it's really a pleasure for me to introduce um, both this session as well as our two speakers. Um, I'm actually here representing the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, one of the IGF dynamic coalitions, as GFMD is essentially my day job. 
And um, I have been an ICT sustainability advocate working within this community since 2016. Um, I opened this segment uh, by stressing that the progress we've made on the nexus of internet governance and environmental sustainability is significant. Although now seemingly validated by the MAG as an internet governance issue, the relationship between the environment and internet governance has a rocky history. With some, with some questioning the need to include uh, such discussion within internet governance fora. As our previous speakers have demonstrated, however, this is a topic inherently connected to sustainable development, human rights, international efforts to combat climate change, such as COP, and of course, digital inclusion. Moreover, many of these discussions are happening in a siloed way, where there is little cross-pollination of ideas and communities. So it's also important here within this section, well, sorry, within this, this session, uh, to import, it's important to recognize that there are three key components that this session is meant to address. Um, one is the role of digital technology in creating a more sustainable world, while the second highlighted the other side of that coin, ensuring that ICTs themselves and the infrastructure that supports them are sustainable from their design and production to their emissions and life cycle. So now this section will focus on a third critical element, the data that fuels these technologies and how such data can be harnessed to assess environmental issues such as climate change and biodiversity loss, but also monitor the issues raised in sections one and two. Specifically, it seeks to address how we can unlock relevant data held by public and, pri and private sector actors and collectively build a digital ecosystem of data and analytics to monitor things like greenhouse gas emissions, climate risks in real time, while also informing climate safe investments and promoting a more sustainable digital economy through robust collaboration. To speak to this, I'm honored to introduce David Jensen, head of program at the UN Environmental Pro uh, Program, UNEP, who will present the work of the UNEP's Digital Transformation Task Force and also address how policymaking can benefit from big data to better understand the impacts of policy decisions on sustainability. And joining uh, David is uh, Pablo Hinojosa, and the Strategic Engagement Director at Asia Pacific Network Information Center, APNIC, one of the five regional internet registries, who will also discuss, um, who will then discuss how policymakers, businesses, civil society, and other actors can cooperate within the existing infrastructure of the IGF to harness the power of data and emerging technologies in the face of a climate crisis. So David, the floor is yours. David, you are on mute, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for letting me know and thank you very much for that uh, excellent introduction, Michael. Uh, can you everybody now see my screen? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Uh, it's a great honor to be here and I am absolutely thrilled that this is being addressed at the IGF in the main session. This is a huge precedent uh, and I'm really pleased to be able to speak to this uh, particular issue. Uh, the title of this five minute intervention is really, you know, digitalizing environmental sustainability and climate action. How do we actually do it in practice? Uh, and the context for this, this session is pretty straightforward. We have these two core trends sweeping the planet. On the one hand, we have a compounding set of environmental crises, be it the climate crisis, the nature crisis, the pollution crisis. And business as usual is not working at the speed and scale necessary to solve these crises. So we fundamentally need exponential change in the way we go about handling these, these problems. On the other hand, we have digital technologies and digital transformation also sweeping the planet. And these are leading to an exponential increase in the availability of environment and climate data. We have unprecedented access to data now at a speed, scale, and scope never before seen. We have data coming in from a number of sources, public sector, private sector, citizen science, academia, and a lot of that data is now spatial. We can actually see where it's coming from and the environmental context that's generating it. And these are hugely important uh, characteristics. And so the question for this panel how do we begin to embed environmental data and sustainability metrics 
into the digital economy so that it helps to solve these three planetary crises in the next 10 years. That's the problem statement we have to solve uh, in this particular sector. And this is really what the IGF, we're hoping the IGF can help tackle. Now the internet is the most successful information architecture in human history. And so if we're looking at this broader question of environmental uh, digitalization, digitalizing environmental sustainability, how do we harness the internet? And how do we learn the lessons of how it was governed as the economy moves from this analog state uh, to the digital state? And in particular, we need to be thinking about, well, well how do we harness uh, this digital network? How do we benefit from this digital ecosystem and contribute to the digital ecosystem? And then how do we develop a multi-stakeholder governance model for this new economy uh, that is really learning from and, and leveraging the IGF and some of the processes that the IGF has put in place over the number, a number of years? And I think there are these two key questions we have to answer. Um, how can the IGF help harness internet standards and digital infrastructure to drive this, this new era of digital environmental sustainability? And then how can the IGF contribute to the multi-stakeholder governance of this transition so it is inclusive, equitable, and sustainable? And if we can bring the, the environment community together with the digital communities together, we have this historic opportunity now to really hard code environmental sustainability norms and metrics into this new operating system of the digital economy. And if we can do this, there are sort of four key goals we need to accomplish together. The first is looking at the, the regulatory side of the digital economy. How do we enable regulators to transparently measure national and global progress against our environmental goals and commitments? And how can we do that in a rapid and automated way? The second is looking at investors. How do we help investors access data and analytics on environmental climate risks and opportunities uh, to inform investment decision making? The third is looking at the producers, the production side of the economy. How can we enable the measurement, the certification, and the sharing of data on the environmental performance of supply chains of all uh, products across their supply chains and across their value chains? And then finally, how do we empower consumers to really adopt sustainable lifestyles and behaviors uh, through algorithms, through nudges, through sharing, uh, and other digital techniques? And ultimately, how do we interconnect all of this through this digital ecosystem for the planet? And ultimately, that is simply a combination of data, infrastructure, analytics, insights, and a decentralized governance framework. And that really has to then inform the core pillars of the economy and ensure that those core pillars have access to the kind of data and analytics that they need. So finally, we really stand at this pivotal moment in human history in terms of shaping the future governance of the internet to help digitalize environmental sustainability. The first step forward is for the IGF to adopt environmental digital cooperation as a key topic, which it seems to be doing. We are also inside the UN Environment Program adopting digital transformation for environmental sustainability as a key priority over the coming four years. And we'd really like to work hand in hand with the IGF to address a number of core topics. And I'll finish on these topics. The first, again, how do we build this decentralized network of environmental data and analytics as a digital public good? How can this environmental data be licensed, shared and quality controlled using the emerging API ecosystem? What are the business models we can use to pay for digital public goods? And how do we share revenues uh, when digital public goods are monetized? What are the key principles and key safeguards needed for public-private collaboration? And finally, how do we monitor and mitigate the environmental impacts of ICT in terms of energy e-waste materials? And this was the issue from the previous session. So I think the IGF is a tremendous opportunity uh, for, for stakeholders in both of these domains to connect, collaborate, combine efforts to really harness data and digital transformation to save the planet. And I really hope we can find a path to work on this together. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, David. Um, Pablo, uh, if you're ready, I'll over to you. 
Good morning from Brisbane, Australia. It's uh, 3 a.m. here, so I hope I can make some sense. The first thing I want to say is a very warm welcome to you, David, to the IGF. I really think the IGF can help you with these challenges that you very well explained. It is an honor for me to be here at this virtual IGF in 2020, uh, which has four main themes, uh, data, trust, inclusion, and for the first time ever in 15 years, environment. This is a wonderful opportunity, especially for the internet technical community to take positive action and participate on this theme to improve the health of the planet. Historically, organizations like mine, like APNIC, uh, were the ones originally doing internet governance, consisting mainly in coordinating technical elements of the internet, such as IP addresses and the DNS. In the early days of the IGF, it was argued that internet governance was only about how these so-called critical internet resources should be managed. And APNIC participated in these discussions and supported a multi-stakeholder model defending a collaborative approach where the technical community, together with other stakeholders, could agree on broader internet governance decisions. Now, I want to share a, a simple reflection. This is about the efforts required to re deploy the internet around the world. Still incomplete, but covering almost every corner and more than half of the world's population. The point I want to make is that these efforts have been as challenging as those required to solve collective action problems for its governance. The cooperative model and the array of organizations that are needed to keep a single, global, open, stable, and secure internet, this has not been a small undertaking. And the IGF has played an important role in building this multi-stakeholder model. Over the years, internet governance has grown in terms of scope and complexity. David just talked about the digital transform transformation needed to understand the problem of climate change. It is estimated that there is close to a 68% data gap needed to measure progress on 93 key environmental indicators to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. To solve this data gap, we need to build a data crunching platform to help save the planet. So here is where we want to make a concrete proposal, which actually we discussed uh, with David recently in a workshop at the Asia Pacific Regional IGF meeting. There is much to say about energy consumption of the ICT sector, e-waste. These are big problems, but we don't think the IGF will help solve, for example, 5G's carbon impact. But the IGF can support this digital transformation, the one that David talked about, through data governance and collective action. So what does it take to address this challenge? And here I'm trying to translate David's concepts into the IGF. David talked about three elements, a digital network, which is the internet, an information ecosystem, which is a collaborative effort between the internet and the environmental communities and a governance model, which the IGF is ideally suited to help develop. This is all that it takes. And I cannot think of a better place than the IGF for government officials, international and regional organizations, data scientists, space agencies, satellite companies, geospatial businesses, cloud computing platforms, internet service providers, climate change organizations, citizen science associations, and civil society groups to meet and work together in developing an environmental data governance framework. It is for this reason that we in APNIC um, supported an initiative recently submitted to the IGF MAG to start the best practices forum for the governance of environmental data. This initiative is an opportunity for the IGF to shed light on its governance experience and apply it to government environmental data. This is a, a, a collaborative opportunity where the IGF can demonstrate one more time how it can be used for good, this time for the good of the planet. I trust the MAC will support this proposal for the internet governance and the environmental communities to use the IGF for what is best uh, bringing people together. And we'll ask, of course, community members to join this best practices forum with the IGF to trigger and drive this digital transformation. I will leave it there and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pablo. And also thank you for being uh, up so late 
up so early, however you want to say it. We really appreciate you being here and we appreciate all the work that you did to make sure that the session is, in, is uh, included in the APIGF as well. So uh, having said that, um, are there any questions for David and Pablo that we could address that are specifically related to this section? Um, let me, I'm checking the Q&A. There's a couple in the Q&A. Um, Uh, yes, okay, there's uh, going to hear from uh, Christos uh, Basilios. Uh, tackling the climate, uh, climate change challenge, tackling the, cl the climate crisis requires systemic changes which need to start yesterday. What is the systemic component that ICTs are targeting towards this direction? Um, David, would you, feel, would you like to take that or would you be able to? I'm not sure I'm fully, uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if, if Lewis might want to tackle this one from Jesse. In particular, this is exactly what Jesse has been uh, looking at and, and, and they have a, a new report on this particular issue. I'm just wondering if Jesse, uh, sorry, if Lewis might want to step in and, uh, and answer this one. From, from my side, we have to start uh, fundamentally by you know, bringing transparency uh, to the current progress on where the emissions are coming from and and basically how, how close are we and how close are governments and companies on towards their targets. So it, it fundamentally begins with that transparency element. And that, that's obviously a question of collecting a sufficient amount of data and publishing that data and, make sh and making sure that the performance of individual companies, of individual products, of individual governments is, is fully transparent. So that's certainly the first step uh, for my side, but I'm not, I don't think I'm, 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 I'm informed enough to know specifically how ICT companies are, are doing the uh, targeting. So maybe Lewis can step in for that one. Lewis, if, if you are still available, if you would like to, to, to come in, please do. I would also like to apologize very quickly to Marcus, who is going to be, uh, who's supposed to be leading this part of, the, um, part of the section. So Marcus, please, at any point, please come in as well. If you'd like to answer, if you'd like to facilitate, be my guest. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentations. And I'm very convinced that we will be able to jump over the narrow perspectives in improving the digitization and the environment and, and use the digitization in the end in a way that we will see real progress in achieving environmental goal why farther than in digitalization direct. Um, David, they really um, show us a very clear way and, and focus on this issue. Very important also, I think, the public interest in, in these tools and standards that we need to, to go there is really big and we should not leave these critical internet resources to, to large private actors only. IGF and, and other international actors like UNEP and, and climate secretariat and, and whatever can play really an important role here. So they also need to, to take into account the possibilities of digitization, of course. So, so let's go and, and use all these networks to improve our environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. And now if, if we have some time still for, for questions, there's this excellent question here from Mark Carvel from uh, who, and it's really speaking to, a, to something that's become close to my heart. Can public sector administration and large corporate enterprises do more through their procurement to drive reduction of environmental impacts of digital technologies. Now, this is a little bit separate from climate data per se, but I do very much think that this very much aligns with that third point that you made, David, about how if we're looking at supply chains, if we're looking at transparency and whatnot, procurement involves a big aspect of that um, in that, uh, that you know, process. So would you, are you, do you feel comfortable speaking about procurement or about, you know, the, the, what we can do as well in terms of uh, facilitating that? Yeah, absolutely. As you say, in many countries, government procurement and private sector procurement is, is even more in terms of impact than, uh, than consumer, than end consumers. Uh, so it can fundamentally have a, a transformative shift in the, in, in driving the, the adoption of uh, technologies, really driving uh, demand. So absolutely, procurement policies is a fundamental anchor, I think, upon which this, this digital transformation has to rest, absolutely. But of course, 
that also then, as we said, depends fundamentally on getting the metrics coming out of the supply chains. So procurement decisions can be made. And as uh, Cara mentioned, getting access to the certifications and making sense of those certifications so you can actually uh, sustainably procure product is difficult. Um, and so we really need global uh, standards on how to calculate these uh, environment and climate footprints, how to communicate them, how to embed them into digital product passports. And then as you say, how to, how to connect that into procurement systems and procurement policies uh, so we can have a, a mutually reinforcing cycle. Thank you so much, David. And uh, Pablo, I don't know, or Marcus, were you raising your hand, Marcus? Just supporting the 100%. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and here you are. Good. Now we can, we can see you. Uh, Pablo, I don't know if you have anything to add about procurement per se. Um, you're more than welcome to, especially as it relates to what, um, you know, our, uh, what, what the technical community can do. Um, if I will open, I will keep that open for you if you'd like to address procurement. I would also like to ask you a very specific question, and that is that in terms of the IGF as a multi-stakeholder community, um, in addition to potentially joining the BPF, do you have any other concrete suggestions for what we as a community can do to support this topic and to support kind of, like I said, cross-sectoral pollination of ideas and discussions and, uh, um, you know, knowledge, essentially? I mean, I think what we have here is an opportunity to, to make a positive contribution to something that is very much needed. And, and the IGF has a community with expertise and a track record of aggregating uh, different issues through different perspectives, uh, issues such as procurement and uh, many others. So in order to develop this agenda of environment within the IGF, we need to think about whether we would like it to be an eternal problem statement or whether we can contribute with concrete actions uh, towards uh, a goal. And I think David's goal of the data ecosystem for the planet is, is, is a very relevant one where the internet com technical community among many other stakeholders have something to contribute, particularly in the context of the IGF. So it's about fostering collective action in support of the digital ecosystem for the planet. Thank you, Pablo. I just want to say, I want to thank you and David very much for, uh, for your interventions, Marcus as well, for you for joining for this part of the discussion. Just you know, to, to wrap this section up before I give it back to Christoph, I just want to say two things. One is that it's, to me, I know I'm a bit biased in this, but it seems to me that it's incredibly clear that there is so much space for environmental subjects within this, uh, within our community. And there is a lot more work we need to do in terms of connecting the people that may not have otherwise been involved in these discussions. And if I can just kind of close by saying on a very personal note, we have been working so, so hard over the past many, many years to, to bring this topic to the discussion. It's such, it, it, you, I can't explain in words how, how amazing it is to see this happening. And uh, it, it really fills me with a lot of joy and enthusiasm to continue uh, pushing this forward. So thank you everyone who made this happen. And with that, Christoph, I'm happy to give the floor back to you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very for much. Me, everyone. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Okia, for your valuable contribution as well as to other uh, panelists. So it's really great discussion. It shows that both the public and private sector can work together in collecting and using data in order to build a comprehensive digital ecosystem. On a personal note, if I may briefly share with you uh, my own experience as a policymaker in my capacity as Deputy Minister for Digital Affairs in Poland a few years back. So data sharing policies were then, I mean, 2016, 17, starting to hit the tables of the senior officials in the EU. And Poland has for a long time understood the importance of sharing, accessing and using data. At that time, my government was the leader of so-called like-minded group of countries in the EU, it was approximately 16, 17 countries. 
and indicated the discussion formalized as a non-paper on free flow of data, which was later on the backbone of the biggest European digital strategy, which was a digital single market strategy. Just, just to a little bit comment on that. So our efforts brought some important policies um, about in the EU, and I'm personally happy to see a follow-up to those policies in a number of European Commission's initiatives that we are now that, that that are now taking place. With with this in mind, I want to share with you that on the 11th November, so in a couple of days, 11 November 2020, the European Commission is planning to announce a legislative pr proposal for the Data Governance Act. This document aims to create a framework for the development of a secure data sharing infrastructure. It will also generate the mechanism and requirements in order to facilitate the provision of data sharing services, as well as uh, access to public sector data within the EU. This is just one of the examples of addressing this issue, but a very concrete and transparent one. Uh, before a wrap up um, a session, now I, I, I try a little bit to, to, to summarize our today's discussion on the environmental issues with uh, relation to digitalization. So we try to address the impact of existing and emerging digital technologies on climate change from very different perspectives. In this regard, we have presented the current initiatives and ways of improving them. Next, we have analyzed possible solutions to reduce the carbon footprint of digital technologies and shown some lessons learned from different uh, communities, which is great. Then we have given you some hints on how every one of us can contribute in our everyday life. And finally, we have touched upon data governance, especially big data to help us monitor the emission of greenhouses, gases, and climate risk, which is extremely important. Having this in mind, I wish to recall the G20 Osaka leaders declaration from the last year. It recognized that improving resource efficiency through policies and approaches such as circular economy, sustainable materials management, the three R, which is reduce, reuse, recycle, contribute to the SDGs. It also stressed the importance of energy transmission that realized the three E plus S standard, which is energy, energy security, economic efficiency, environment and safety in order to transform our energy systems into affordable, reliable, sustainable and low emission systems as soon as possible. This declaration has also affirmed a role of data for the development. Therefore, we should take a closer look at the environment data as well. For our last activity today during this session, we have prepared for you a small surprise, so-called, which is an audience pool. So in a minute, we will display for you the proposed key takeaways from each of the session segments, asking for your vote on whether you agree with them. This pool is for sure uh, anonymous. It will help us uh, gather your views and put them forward for future discussions at the IGF level, which is a great contribution from the audience as well. So please express your opinions as soon as the pool will show up on your screens and thank you very much in advance for your feedback. I will, I will leave it for a moment. Oh, so we have the poll right now, so, so we, can, we can spend a few moments and, and, and vote. Okay, so I have done the same, so. We'll see <clears throat> in a minute, hopefully the, the, the results are later on to be published on the IGF website. So just to move a little bit uh, into the closing uh, uh, area. So just so ladies and gentlemen, Actually, we have reached the end of our session at this at the time. 
on behalf of myself and my other colleagues, I mean organizers, moderators, speakers, panelists who have engaged themselves in preparing this session, I wish to express my deepest thanks for your active attendance as well. This is extremely valuable for us. Finally, I would like to kindly invite all of you to Katowice next year for the IGF 2021. Hopefully we will meet there in, in person so that you will be that you will have the opportunity to, exp to experience the traditional Polish hospitality as well as the taste of the specialities of Silesian cuisine and learn about the tourist attraction of the region. So actually we prepared a lot of the ideas for this year, but as you may know, we had to move that to the next year. So hopefully in December, 2021, we will meet all in Katowice, Poland. So thank you again for your time and see you all next year in Poland. Thank you. And thank you very much to you, Mr. Schubert, for the great moderation and to <laughs> all of our colleagues uh, for their insights. Uh, and again, to my Mac colleagues for the uh, amazing help uh, putting this session together. Liana, June, Delcy, Afi, Luis, Cengetai, Anya, everybody, the Secretariat, um, and to our Chair Henriette, who has been pushing very hard for us to have environment on the, on the table. So uh, I just want to echo one uh, of the takeaways for today um, that, were, that was coming out from, from Michael's session with David and, and Pablo. Um, we cannot solve the climate crisis at the IGF, but I am confident that we cannot solve the climate crisis without the IGF. So let's carry on the discussions and see you all in Poland next year. See you. Bye. Thank